Welcome everyone to the inductive reasoning lecture. So we've already discussed the um, uh, inductive reasoning in general, and we know that from chapter two, where we talked about the two types of reasoning, one deductive and one inductive. Uh, and remember, deductive is based on certainty. You should know that by now. And uh, inductive reasoning, we're now gonna go into more depth on, which is based on probability. Just like there are kind of standard forms of deductive reasoning, there are kind of standard arguments and argument forms in inductive reasoning uh, that uh, will come up a lot in your everyday life, but also in this class, of course. In order to introduce you to inductive reasoning, I'm going to use a famous example called the barrel of apples, uh, which is actually a type of sample argument. And you can see that's one of the types that are sometimes called a generalization from a sample. Um, but that's just to sort of introduce you to the, the basic idea of inductive reasoning. Then we're going to go into the three major types of arguments. So a statistical syllogism is kind of similar to some of the deductive syllogisms we looked at. So for instance, a deductive syllogism is like, all men are mortal, John is a man, so John is mortal. Uh, an inductive syllogism or statistical would use, instead of all, it would use a word like most or some. You know, so, all, so most men are stupid, John is a man, so John is stupid, right? Um, remember, it's still an argument, even if we disagree with the premises. We're just we're not getting to the evaluation part yet. But anyways, that's that type of argument. Um, now, a sample argument is a little different than a syllogism. A syllogism tries to conclude something probable about a specific thing. So, in other words, a, sil a statistical syllogism goes to a, a more specific conclusion that is pr still based on probability, which is why it's inductive. But a sample argument goes to a more general conclusion. So like I said, sometimes it's called a generalization from a sample, you know, and it, scientists use this reasoning all the time, you know, because you can't study everything. So let's say a biologist is trying to study the behavior of birds in a particular area. He might say, well, based on the sample of the birds in this part of the forest or the rainforest or whatever, we can conclude that the rest of the species have similar behavior. And just uh, as we learn in chapter two, Keep in mind that inductive arguments can always be wrong. You can always be wrong. They're, they're, that's the difference. In a deductive argument, if those premises are true, that conclusion must be true. We can quibble over the premises, but if they're true, the conclusion must follow. But in an inductive argument, the conclusion could always be mistaken or ambiguous. Again, inductive reasoning is about building up a case for something. Um, and no matter how close you are to that certainty, as you'll see in a minute when I discuss the barrel of apples example, there's always a small percentage that you could be mistaken or that conclusion could be faulty. Um, and that's the idea. And then finally, we'll look at arguments by analogy. Uh, analogies actually happen, I think, more often than people realize. We're often using one realm to explain another realm. You know, so for instance, we we say that our brains are wired a certain way. That's clearly a metaphor from computers, right? Our brains don't have wires. But the idea is that computers are wired, meaning you have computers have this sort of inborn ability to run certain processes that were programmed into them. And when we say our brains are wired, that's what we're saying. We're saying we have an inborn uh, sort of pr you know ability to process certain things, just like a computer. Uh, so anyways, arguments by analogy help us understand one realm by reference to another one. Right? They say this thing is kind of like this other thing, and here's, what, here's the conclusion we can draw from it. Now that shouldn't be confused with just an analogy. So this is a crucial point to understand in this chapter, and it'll really help you on the test if you know this. Um, an argument by analogy contains an analogy in addition to other premises and a conclusion. Right? It has an analogy, but it has other stuff. So it's arguing something from an analogy. Whereas an analogy is just an analogy. It just makes a comparison. So just making a comparison, that's one thing. But drawing a conclusion from a comparison, that's an argument, right? Because it involves all the structure of an argument that we've been talking about for this whole class. So anyways, that'll become more clear as we go along. Let's talk about the barrel of apples. So let's just imagine, and obviously this is just a picture to get your mind thinking about it, but just imagine you have a bigger barrel of apples. And let's just say you know, you've been told by a very trustworthy source that there are 100 apples in that barrel. So here you are standing in front of a barrel of 100 apples. And let's say somebody puts a cover over the apples so you can't see what they look like. 
but there's a hole at the top of that cover that allows you to reach in and pick out an apple. So in other words, you know there's 100 apples, you know you can't see what they're like, but you can pick one out at a time. Let's just say you're in that situation. You pick out a few apples. Let's just say you picked out three. And let's say those three apples were all rotten apples. They were not good enough to eat. They were all rotten. Now from that, could you conclude reasonably that the last 97 apples were rotten? Of course not, right? You, not reasonably. That would provide you some evidence, but very meager, limited evidence as to the state of the rest of the apples in the barrel. Right? But what if I took out five apples and they were all rotten? Could I then conclude that the last 95 are rotten? Probably not, because it's only two more apples and the entire barrel of apples is still 100. So even though that increases the probability that the rest are rotten, that doesn't actually tell us that, it's not a strong enough argument to conclude fully that the rest of those apples are rotten. What if I took out 25? I reach in one at a time and 25 of those apples are rotten. Could I now conclude that the rest of the barrel of apples is rotten? No, not even yet, not quite yet. It's a way better argument to be fair, right? It's a much bigger sample, you have a quarter of the entire barrel of apples there sitting on your, wherever you're putting the rotten ones, and they're all rotten. You have a quarter of the apples there. So it's not a terrible argument, and it's way better than five. And if I take 30, it's better than 25. So I hope you're getting the point that this is emphasizing inductive reasoning and that the more evidence you have, the stronger your argument is. But what's also crucial is how do you take that evidence? And we'll come back to this a little bit later, but for now, just consider this. Imagine that I am re when I reach into the barrel of apples, I'm reaching only and taking the apples from the top. Let's just say I'm only taking the apples from the top. Now, let's say I took the same sample of apples and they were all rotten, but I took the apples from different parts of the barrel. Let's say I reached my hand way down so that I was taking apples from the bottom. Isn't that now more likely to um, accurately represent the way the rest of the apples are? Because, because think of it this way. What if all the rotten apples I took out, what if there was just one part of the barrel that had bacteria in it and was rotten, and all the rest of the apples were good? Right? Then that wouldn't be a very good argument. If I just took 25 apples out from the top, from the one rotten part, I'm gonna say, oh, the rest of the apples are rotten, but what if the other 60, you know, or whatever is left are actually all good just because it was, I was only taken out from the one bad part? So if I took them out from different parts, that would reduce the probability that there was another part of the barrel that was all good, right? That wasn't rotten. So this is what we'll talk about later being a, um, a representative sample. When we take a sample, we wanna make sure that uh, it accurately represents what we're trying to conclude about. And if I'm trying to conclude about this whole barrel of apples, which is referred to as the population, from the smaller part of it, I wanna say, this smaller part of this greater population, this greater thing, had these characteristics. So therefore, the rest of the population will also have these characteristics. Now, if the smaller part I took out, the sample is representative and it's taken from different parts of the barrel in this case, my argument that the rest of the barrel will have that characteristic, in this case rottenness, would be even stronger. Right? So it's all about taking a big enough sample and a good enough sample in a, in a sample argument. One last point I want to make about this. Let's say that I took out 99 apples from the barrel. Let's say I have a pile of 99 apples here and they're all rotten. Can I reasonably conclude then that the last apple in the barrel is rotten? I haven't seen it yet. It's in there. Can I reasonably conclude? I think inductively it would be a very, very good argument that that last apple is rotten. But here's how you can tell inductive from deductive. Would you stake your life on it? That that last apple was rotten? Even if those 99 were rotten? Would you give up your career? How much would you bet on that last apple being rotten? Now you're crazy if you say you would stake your life on it because we all know there's some remote possibility that that apple could be good. Maybe it was the one good apple that whoever put that barrel together threw in on the top and somehow you just didn't pick it out each time. You know that there is some small probability that that apple might be good and not rotten and therefore would cause you the death penalty if you staked your life on it, right? So that's why most sane people would not stake their life on that last one being rotten. But that precisely 
shows you the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning. Because in deductive reasoning, you always have that guarantee. You could stake your life on a deductive argument. If you say, hey, look, if you tell me these are true, then this one's got to be true. I'll stake my life. It's, it has to be, by definition, you could say. But in an inductive argument, there's always room for doubt, even if it's the tiniest, slightest bit. Now, don't let that trick you into believing that inductive arguments are bad or worse. Inductive arguments can be very, very good with enough evidence. You know, you can make a knockdown case for something. Uh, even if you could always admit that you can be wrong. In fact, some of the best scientific theories are like that, where the theorists will say, look, guys, I don't know. I haven't worked out all the details here. I might be wrong about some things, but this is the framework. And the framework might still have value or might still be generally good. So anyways, uh, that's, that's the, the basics of, of how inductive reasoning works and how the probability in inductive reasoning works. So something else to think about is that um, uh, inductive reasoning, we're gonna forget about validity and soundness now. Validity and soundness are properties only of deductive arguments. And once we figure out that an argument is inductive, we no longer talk about validity. We talk about strength or weakness. And the reason for that is that the more evidence, the, and not to go back to the barrel of apples, the more apples you pull out of the barrel, the more likely that your conclusion is true the more likely that you've backed up your conclusion. So that's what we would call strong. A weak argument, of course, would be one where you have less evidence and less support. And just as with soundness, there are, of course, cases on the margins where there's going to be disagreements over whether an argument's weak or strong. Uh, you know, for instance, you might have an inductive argument for universal health care that a Democratic um, voter would find very strong, where a conservative voter would not. Um, so there are cases where there's room for debate over strength and weakness, but there are, of course, other cases where it's obvious. I mean, sometimes, you know, juries have an easy job because there's so much evidence presented against somebody that it would be ridiculous not to convict them or whatever the, the case is. And other times an argument is clearly so weak, you know, you only have circumstantial evidence that it's obvious, you obviously can't convict. Um, so there are clear-cut cases of strong and weak arguments, but there's also cases on the margins. Uh, the fact that there are cases on the margins, though, should not take away from the value of reasoning in general. Right? Sometimes people do that. They say, oh, well, there's cases where people don't disagree, so let's throw it all out. No, no, no. It's still useful in many other cases. I'm not denying there isn't some complication when people disagree. Now, the next point I would make is that um, inductive, sometimes this is a confusion. When we talk about probability in an inductive argument, we're not talking about the probability of the claim by itself. We're talking about the probability of the conclusion given the premises. So premises and conclusions should be seen as one well-oiled machine, as I've said before, that work together. Right? Premises and conclusions must work together. So if I just look at a claim like, say, uh, let me see the example I had here. Oh yeah, so let's, let's say I just took some guy named Smith off the street and I said, how likely is it that this guy is a libertarian politically? That's a different question than if I said, I already know that Smith favors individual freedom, and I'll throw this argument up on the screen. If I already know that he favors individual freedom and I conclude that he's a libertarian from that, um, that's more based on an argument form. So I'm saying the probability that he's a libertarian, given that he favors individual freedom, that's going to be different than just the overall probability of a single claim. What I'm trying to get you guys to remember is that arguments are inductive not based on whether you're certain of a particular claim or not certain. Sometimes students say that. They'll say, oh, my argument's inductive because I know this claim is true. Not how an inductive argument works or deductive. It works because given the premises, there is a relation of likelihood to the conclusion. That's what makes it inductive. What makes it deductive is given the premises, there is a relation of certainty to the conclusion. Not just your feeling of certainty or the fact that a single individual claim is certain. Remember that claims by themselves can be completely independent of an argument. An argument is composed of claims or statements that logically connect. That's what makes it an argument. But claims can exist by themselves and not be an argument at all. Um, so try to understand the difference between the general probability of a specific claim versus the probability of a conclusion given the premise that is presented. Okay, so 
One other point I would like to make about inductive reasoning is that because of the nature of um, probability, it can lead to wildly different conclusions from the same information. Uh, because you're not, because unlike in a deductive argument where if you're all working with the same premises, it leads to the same conclusion, anybody would see, right? With an inductive argument, because it's not guaranteed or certain, the conclusion isn't certain, that means that certain arguments could point to very different conclusions. For instance, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Ancient Aliens series uh, that is strangely on the History Channel. Um, I think one of those is on the History Channel. Uh, and um, it's very interesting to, to see some of these theories and think about some of the um, theories about aliens. But let, let me just tell you one about the Maya. So there are, there's the, a very small proportion of archaeologists, some would consider them fringe, who seem to believe that ancient aliens did visit the Maya, and that's what explains some of the architecture and art from the Maya. Uh, and one that's particularly um, held up is in Palenque in southern Mexico, which is beautiful, by the way. Um, hot, but amazing. I recommend going if you can. Um, inside one of the temples there is this uh, sort of relief you see on the left that an artist has turned into an, uh, a picture. And in the relief, um, the, the small proportion of archaeologists who are in favor of the theory of ancient aliens will suggest that the dude, you can see that there's a guy there, um, and it looks, what these theorists say is he's in a spacecraft, right? He's kind of manipulating the controls of a spacecraft, and they argue that this shows that there were ancient aliens that visited these, the Maya and helped them to be the advanced society that they were at the time. However, other archaeologists, most archaeologists, look at that same information and they say, well, actually, this fits with the other Mayan mythology that we know about, which is that this was a king being sucked by the gods into the underworld because the uh, Maya had a sophisticated theology that um, included an underworld and was related to divinity and authority and so forth. So in other words, most archaeologists look at that and say, yeah, that fits with Mayan mythology. It's, per it's absolutely... Uh, makes sense. It's not a spacecraft. They draw one conclusion, whereas this small proportion of the archaeologists draws the other one. Right? So this is the difficulty of inductive reasoning, is that you can have intelligent people um, draw different conclusions from the same information, and there's no way around it. It's just the way, the way things are. Okay, so statistical syllogism. This one's pretty straightforward. Just to give you the bare bones argument form, Basically the idea, some of this or that, some x's or y's, we have an x here, so um, this thing is also a y, right? Um, it could be most, you know, it, it just would never be all or none, uh, but it's that idea that some proportion or most of proportion of this thing are like this, this other thing shares this property, so this other one will have it too. Just as the example, the concrete example says, some cars are Toyotas, this is a car, so it must be a Toyota. So it's a similar sort of deducing, except it's not deduction, it's induce, it's induction. But it's similar to that style of syllogism. All x's or y's, this is an x or this is a y. Um, but just remember, the word some and most, that completely distinguishes it as an inductive argument rather than deductive. Okay. Um, I'm just going to write up one more example. So let's say I had this argument. About 90% of truck drivers are Republicans. Tim drives a truck, so Tim is a Republican. By the way, this is totally made up statistics. It was just made up for the sake of understanding the idea. I have no idea how many Republicans drive trucks. But if we assume those premises are true, then that would be a um, fairly decent uh, inference that Tim is a Republican. Notice that we can make the argument weaker by just changing the percentage. Right? If, if I said about 60%, of truck drivers are Republicans, Tim drives a truck, so he's a Republican. That would weaken the argument because the um, overall probability we're referring to has been weakened, right? has been lessened in the first premise. So it's less likely that Tim is one of them if there's only 60% versus 90% um, who have that, that feature. So anyways, statistical syllogisms are pretty straightforward. Uh, the only thing you'll run into that's a little bit tricky on some of the assessment questions and on the homework questions, which you can do on the practice discussion, uh, is distinguishing a syllogism from a sample. 
uh, because a syllogism, and let me remind you now that hopefully this will help you in the future, a syllogism goes to a specific conclusion. Notice here that the conclusion about is about one Toyota. It's not about all Toyotas or most Toyotas. In a sample argument, as we're about to see, it goes to a more general conclusion. So a sample argument would refer to most Toyotas. So it's reversed. Uh, a statistical syllogism goes to a specific inductive conclusion, inductive, in, uh, sorry, probable conclusion, whereas a sample argument goes to a general but probable conclusion. So let's look at a sample argument now. And let's return it to the barrel of apples so we have a reference. Like I said, the barrel of apples serves two purposes. It gives you a general introduction to inductive reasoning but it also is a sample argument. And so in a sample argument, just it's very simple it, on, on the face of it. It gets complicated as we evaluate more complex examples. But on the face of it, it's just you're trying to figure out what something is like based on a smaller part of it. It's like if you have a piece of pie, a pie on the table, how do you know if the whole pie is good? You try a piece of the pie. Right? You come in and you say, hmm, that was a good apple pie. And now you know that the rest of the pie is good because you've tried some. You had a sample of the pie. Now, maybe you want to, but you clearly don't have to eat the entire pie to know if it's good. You can take some of it, and from that, you can conclude about the rest of it. Uh, so that's exactly what a sample argument does. Um, you know, you might even think of on a lesser example. You might meet somebody from a particular family, and they have a lot of brothers and sisters. And you're like, well, you know families are similar, This I, I hung out with this guy, he was pretty cool, probably the rest of them are cool too. Now remember, you could be wrong, because an inductive argument always could be wrong, but that's another example of taking a piece of something and trying to figure out what the rest of it is like. So as, as this gets more complex, just remember that's what these arguments do. You're taking a piece and you're trying to figure out the whole, and the, the pie analogy works for many students. So a piece of the pie tells you about the whole pie. You don't have to eat the whole thing. So scientists and um, philosophers have divided up uh, the way we take a sample. So we call the sample, literally, and let me just refer to the barrel of apples to keep it simple. It's the barrels we took, it's the apples we took out of the barrel. Because that's it, the sample is the evidence, think of it that way. The sample is the premise and the argument. You're using a sample to try to figure out that sample is what tells you the nature of the rest of the thing, which we call the population. Um, so in the barrel of apples example, as I said, we take out three apples, we take out five apples. That was the sample, because that's what was telling us about the rest of the barrel. Also in the barrel of apples example, the full container of apples, the full 100 apples in the barrel, that would be the population. So when you take your sample, your sample is actually being pulled from the population but you're taking a smaller proportion of the population to help you figure out about the population. Now, the attribute of interest is the thing you're trying to figure out. Now, this confuses some students because they're like, well, how do I know what the attribute is? The attribute is whatever the arguer decides it is. So it's arbitrary on some level. So in the example I gave, I said rottenness, but in this PowerPoint, I have ripeness. I could have, equally, I could have equally said redness, Right? I could have equally said, maybe I was looking for red versus green apples. That's whatever you decide, whatever the researcher, the person who's making the argument decides, that's what the attribute is. What are they trying to figure out? Right? If, I'm a, if I'm a biologist and I want to figure out how these particular birds behave, um, what's the behavior I'm looking for? Am I looking for more social behavior where they're chirping, talking, talking to each other? Or am I looking for um, you know, foraging behavior? What am I, what's the thing? that I'm trying to figure out based on the evidence that I've taken, the sample that I've taken. What's the thing that I'm trying to generalize to? And that's what the, um, what the, the attribute of interest is. So just to back it up, if we're going back to the barrel of apples, if I, I pull the apples out of the barrel, there's my sample. I wanna know if they're ripe or rotten, there's my attribute. And I wanna know to what extent the rest of the population, the rest of the apples that I did not take out, Right, so the population includes the sample that you took plus all the rest that's in there. And remember, the whole point of this argument is to try to figure out what the rest of that thing is like. You know, what is the rest like? And just so you can understand how this is important, this might help us navigate, for instance, like let's say we're talking about how does a, um, uh, 
um, a minority student navigate the, um, the, you know, maybe structural racism or the, the barriers that they face in college, we could take the experiences of a number of African Americans and we could say, look, we're not saying this matches everyone's experience, but this is a sample of the um, consistent barriers that these people overcame. And that would be a scientific argument, right? That would be a, a, a legitimate research project because we'd be taking this sample of how some people experience something, which would help other people in the population figure out how they have to navigate that situation. And so sample arguments are extremely important to science and to reason. Now, just a couple other um, points about samples. So first, the bigger the sample you take, the less of what we call the error margin. And the error margin is basically how likely are you to be wrong, right? The margin of error, how, how likely is it that you're wrong? If I, again, if I take 75 apples out of the barrel, I'm less likely to be wrong than if I took 70 apples out of the barrel, going back to the 100 apple, uh, barrel of apples example. So the, the more evidence you have, another way to think of it, the bigger the sample, the more evidence, the less likely that your conclusion will be wrong. This is, of course, why when scientists take samples, they try to take as big and robust a sample as possible so that they can then present their research and say, look, I could still be wrong, but here's the likelihood. Like, the likelihood is decreased that I will be wrong. Um, a second point is that a small sample size has a huge error margin. Right? It's just there's no way around it. If I take two apples out of the barrel, there's so many ways in which I could be wrong. The probability against my conclusion, if I take two apples out of the barrel and my attribute of interest is rottenness, those two apples are rotten. The percentage, you know, and my conclusion is the last 98 will be rotten. The likelihood of me being wrong is extremely high. Smaller sample, higher error margin, right? Higher margin of error. Now, the other thing to remember is that, you know, some, some of you might be thinking, well, why don't we just keep taking bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger samples uh, so we can get closer and closer and closer to truth? The other problem with statistics, and this is just the law of averages and statistics, is that after about 500 or 1,000 or so, um, it, the error margin is barely reduced. Right? Once, you take, once you get to a certain level of sample, you're reducing the error margin by like 0.05%. And so that's why scientists typically take samples that are between 500 and 1,500 uh, to draw conclusions, because the error margin is already low enough and just taking more samples will decrease it, but barely for it to matter at all. Uh, so for instance, when people, when, when uh, organizations like Pew Research and um, Reuters and others do polls on like what people feel, they're using this sort of reasoning. They're um, using a much more sophisticated version, but it's the same in principle. They're going out and asking people their opinions based on these very consistent surveys and they usually take, like, like, let's just say the research question, what they're trying to figure out is, um, who are people going to vote for? What they'll do is they'll go to each state and they'll ask people in very different districts and locations, and they'll put that together. They'll take about a thousand people from each state, you know, something like that. And then they'll put all that information together in one to generalize about the probability of who's going to vote for whom. And, uh, it's usually highly accurate. However, as many people complained and saw in the um, uh, 2016 election, it is not always. Uh, and, e and, and many reporters who report on these statistics can have their own biases. There were clearly a lot of people who did not want Trump to be elected who um, reported with too much confidence on the surveys that, oh, Trump's not going to make it. Um, there were some news organizations that actually gave Trump a much higher per chance of winning based on the surveys, like a 30 or 40% chance, which is a pretty high percentage, right? Um, I mean, that's almost a coin toss. It's almost 50%. Uh, so the point is, is that um, sample arguments are very useful and they help us, but they're not perfect and they can be wrong. And again, we should never forget that inductive reasoning can be wrong. Okay, so those are um, scientific samples that I've sort of been referring to thus far, what about everyday samples? Because we make sample arguments on an everyday basis also. And um, so let's consider this one, right? Like, how do you know when a friend is a good cook? How do you know that? Well, if you only had one meal, maybe she got lucky. Maybe he got lucky and just had a, found a good recipe online and made a good meal. Um, that wouldn't decrease the error margin much that like if if I'm trying to conclude is she good or bad and and I said oh she's really good based on this one meal 
that's not enough to support my conclusion, right? It doesn't, my likelihood of being wrong is very high. There's a very high uh, error margin. However, if I keep eating meal after meal after meal and they're all just delicious and then, you know, maybe she gets a job as a professional chef somewhere and everyone else says that her meals are delicious and she's natural, now I'm more likely with more sample, more information, uh, I decrease the error margin, right? My likelihood of being wrong that she's a good chef decreases. Um, so that's a way that our everyday samples work. Now, of course, you're not, I mean, people in their everyday life are not laying out a sample argument to themselves. But, it, but if we, again, if we use slow thinking on our everyday behavior, we can see that at the base of it, there is somewhat of a sample argument being proposed uh, in many cases. So one of the ways we get around a bad sample that leads to what we call a representative sample, like I said before, we call it, um, you take it randomly. We call it, you say you take a random sample and it leads you to a representative sample. Random means that you take it in, a, in such a way that, to go back to the barrel of apples, you don't take them all out from one part of the barrel. Right? That would be a non-random sample, a non-representative sample. If I take all the apples I'm trying to conclude I'm using as my sample, if I take all those apples from one part of the barrel, that is not likely to tell me what the population is uh, accurately. I'm likely to be wrong, more likely to be wrong if I take them out from one part of the barrel. However, if I take them out from different parts, like I said before, that would be considered a random sample and my population would be more likely to be proportional to the evidence I took, to the um, sample that I took. So you can see in this chart that a sociologist has nicely laid it out, and a random sample is basically when part of a population has an equal chance of being represented. And you can see in that case there's four rows, and they took a sample not all from the first row, right? The sample isn't one, two, three, four. The sample is they take, a, they take at least one from each row. And so that's what makes it random. Each, each row has a chance of being represented. Now let's go back to the polling. You know, can you imagine if the pollsters, when they were taking their sample of voting behavior, and they, t they just looked at Texas, and they said, everybody in Texas is going to vote for Trump, it, it says they're going to vote for Trump, therefore, all of Americans will, right? Nobody would believe that, because it's not a random sample. If you take only from one state, that does not generalize to the population of Americans, because we know Texans are different in many ways than other Americans. Same thing with California. If we said, oh, everyone in California says they're going to vote for Clinton, um, therefore she's going to win the presidency, that is representative of only one proportion of Americans, and so it would be wrong to conclude that about the rest of them. If you said people, if you took people in California and you concluded about people in California, then that's okay because that's proportional. Um, so a, a sample must match the population. It must be big enough and it must be random enough um, to have any, any uh, uh, strength. Now, the other thing that could happen is a sample may be biased. It may not only not be random, but it may be ridiculously biased. And this can happen on accident, but it can also unfortunately happen on purpose. Uh, and this, that cynicism is represented by that bottom cartoon there, um, that bottom comic where the guy is basically saying, well, I won't be needing that sample. And the, the implication is that it conflicts with his hypothesis. And so that certainly have been many documented cases of scientists who um, claim to be doing objective work, but they're actually ignoring evidence or misinterpreting evidence that conflicts with their hypothesis or what they want to believe already. Uh, remember, the confirmation bias is not limited to everyday folk like you and I. Um, even the top brightest people in the world can use the confirmation bias. And perhaps it's even worse when they use it because they have power and resources. But anyways, um, a bias sample doesn't represent the population. And you can see the difference here. Uh, you can see that when you have a population, so look at that diagram above the cartoon, there's a population of about 16 people, 12 males, four of exactly 16 people and four males and 12 females, but look at the sample. The sample took only the four males, but it took four of the females, right? That does not accurately represent the population. Um, it should have been closer to two and four, or you know, two and six or something like that uh, to accurately represent the, the proportion of male to female in the population. So anyways, I'm just trying to give you guys a few different ways to understand the difference between a good and bad sample.
So I just want to give you a couple other examples that will, there's a couple more finer points of sample arguments that I would like you guys to understand. And the first one um, is here. So first of all, what if I said, what if I took this sample argument? First premise, most of my teachers are Democrats. Conclusion, therefore, I think most of my, um, most teachers in general are Democrats, right? So I went from most of my teachers to teachers in general. Hopefully you can see that that's not a diversified enough sample. And it's kind of like taking not enough apples from the barrel or from only one part of the barrel. Uh, so in order to have a diversified sample, we would of course have to talk to more teachers than just mine, right? If I, just the experience of one student and their professors is not enough to generalize to um, most teachers being that way and having the characteristic of being a Democrat. Right? So this sample is weak, it's not diversified, it's too small, and it therefore uh, is a very weak argument. Now consider that in comparison to this next one. And this next one is gonna illustrate the point I'm making here. Um, so imagine someone says, look at the rash I just got from that plant. Let's just say it's their first premise. I got a rash from this plant. And they say, therefore, I'm not gonna go near that plant again. Right. Um, that's their conclusion. So I got a rash and that's the reason I'm not gonna go touch that plant again. Let's just say it's poison oak or something. Now this is a tricky one because although the sample is small, it's just that one person's experience, it's a diversified population. I'm, I'm sorry, the population is not diverse. The population is uniform, it's consistent because it's a plant, right? We know that plants are biologically the same. If I get poison oak once, do I have to go get poison oak six other times before I know that poison oak, when I touch it, gives me a rash? Probably one time is enough. You know, it's kind of like going back to the pie. I mean, we know how people make pies. It's not like they put all the sugar in one place and all the butter somewhere else. It's all mixed together. So a pie is a consistent population. That's why, even if I just have a bite of a pie, I kind of know how the pie is like because the population is pretty consistent. It's not like voting behavior where we see a lot of differences in um, beliefs and opinions about who should be elected in different parts of the United States. So the broader point I'm making here is that the sample itself, the, the thing you're talking about, the, sorry, the population itself, the thing you're trying to conclude about, that matters too, right? Like how, how diversified is it? How consistent is it? And so when you're evaluating these arguments, your critical thinking skills have to be on full alert. You have to recognize that. Um, plants are consistent, right? You don't need that many samples to know what to expect from a plant. People aren't. People's opinions are different. So whether an argument is strong does depend on the sample, but it also depends on what you're investigating and the nature of the population. Okay, so let me give you some examples of distinguishing between statistical syllogisms and sample arguments, because these can be tricky, like I said before. So I'm gonna throw an argument up on the board that says, I don't think camphor trees are deciduous. Deciduous is a type of property of a tree. After all, ours isn't. I don't think camphor trees are deciduous. After all, ours isn't. Now let's say you're faced with a question on the assessment. Is that a sample argument or is it a statistical syllogism? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is remember what I learned in chapter one, which is how do I recognize a premise and a conclusion, right? Where's the premise? Where's the conclusion? Because if I can tell the direction of the logic, then I can tell whether it's a sample or a syllogism. Remember, as we've seen, a statistical syllogism goes to a specific conclusion about a thing, and a sample argument goes to a general conclusion about a population. So if I find that the conclusion of the argument is general, it's likely that I'm dealing with a, um, a sample argument. But if I find that the conclusion of the argument is specific, then it's likely that I'm dealing with a statistical syllogism. And the, knowing these things before evaluating these questions can help you understand the difference. So this would be a sample argument. I don't think camphor trees are deciduous after all, ours isn't. So I'm intuiting that the premise is ours. They're using their own tree as evidence for the broader claim that they don't believe camphor trees are deciduous. So the phrase after all is a premise indicator. Remember those from the first chapter, premise and conclusion indicators? After all, this is the case, therefore this must be true. Right? That's kind of what people mean when they say after all. Well, after all, we're gonna hit traffic, so we might as well leave later. 
we're going to hit traffic is the premise. We should leave later is the conclusion. So the same thing is happening here. After all, ours isn't. So that the premise would be, and let me just, I'll put this up on the screen. I'll write up the argument more formally in premise conclusion format. The premise of this argument would be our camphor tree is not deciduous. Therefore, camphor trees are not deciduous. And notice now I can very clearly see this is a, this is a sample argument. By the way, it can always help you on questions on assessments when you write out the argument form um, in premise conclusion format. Uh, it, it often helps, I shouldn't say always, but it often helps uh, to understand what's being asked in the question. So in this case, now that I've laid it out, it's very clear it's a sample argument because it's using evidence of a specific case, the sample of their experience with a tree to make a broader claim about all deciduous tree, all, all trees having this um, all camphor trees, sorry, having the nature of being deciduous. Now compare that with this other one, same content, different direction of the logic. You pro your tree probably won't lose its leaves. Why? Because it's a camphor tree. So this will be thrown up on the screen, but one more time, your tree probably won't lose its leaves. Why? Because it's a camphor tree. This is a statistical syllogism. And the reason is, Consider the direction of the logic. What is the conclusion? What is the premise? Well, they come out right away with a conclusion. They say, your tree probably won't lose its leaves. Why? What is the evidence that this thing is the case? The evidence would be the premise. So the thing they say next, why? It's a camphor tree. That's why. The why is the reasoning, the evidence supporting the conclusion. So the reason that your tree won't lose its leaves, conclusion, the reason premise is it's a camphor tree. So this very clearly goes to a specific conclusion about your tree, which is what makes it a statistical syllogism. Now this one's also tricky because you have to draw from your previous knowledge from chapter one and two about unstated premises and conclusions. And this particular argument has an unstated premise. And that premise is that most camphor trees do not lose their leaves. So you can see that that's a logical assumption. Remember, an unstated premise can often be seen as an assumption of the speaker. The speaker is assuming that relationship, that camphor trees don't lose their leaves. He doesn't state it outright, but it's clearly part of their logic. So when you write it out all together and you've distinguished the premise and conclusion, you can clearly see the direction of the logic is to a specific conclusion, making it a statistical syllogism. Let me do a couple examples because this will also come up on the assessment. Let me do a couple examples where we distinguish between, we look at what we know is a sample argument and I ask you guys for the um, uh, sample population and attribute of interest, right? So you have to identify those three things. You have to identify the apples we took out, the sample, the attribute that's being trying to be figured out in the case I gave, the rottenness, and the population, in the case I gave of the barrel of apples, the full barrel. So now you're looking at other arguments and you're trying to figure out um, what's the sample population and attribute. So let me start with a simple one. What if I said the fries at McDonald's are too salty, judging from these? The fries at McDonald's are too salty, judging from these. Well, we can presume this is somebody at McDonald's eating McDonald's fries and being like, oh, eating them has, has his own fries and saying, oh, these are too salty. So the sample would be the person's fries, right? Because that's the evidence they're using to draw the conclusion. And the population would be fries and McDonald's right? as a whole, all fries and McDonald's. And saltiness would be the attribute of interest. Like I said, don't get confused by the attribute. The attribute is whatever the speaker wants it to be. It can be anything they want to figure out about the population. So in this very simple sample argument, um, we have them coming to the conclusion about the population, the fries at McDonald's, from their experience with the fries at McDonald's, and they're generalizing about saltiness from one to the other. The saltiness of my fries suggests that McDonald's fries in general are salty. Again, it's not a terrible argument, even though it's their own experience, because we know that fast food places have a similar recipe at all their stores, uh, which is why some people continue to go back to them, because they know that it's going to be the same. Okay, how about this one? Most of my professors wear glasses. Again, sample, attribute, 
population. That's what you're trying to figure out. Most of my professors wear glasses. It's a good bet that most professors everywhere wear glasses. So first of all, not the greatest argument because the population is not sufficiently diversified. It's just that person's professors. And also, it's not a consistent population because we know that professors have different, very different behaviors, just like people in general do, and different choices of what they wear. Uh, it's not like the salty f McDonald's fries, which is a much more consistent population. So most of my professors wear glasses. It's a good bet. Most professors everywhere wear glasses. Uh, most of my professors would be the sample in this case, right? That that person's, the speaker's professors, glasses, wearing glasses would be the attribute of interest. That's the thing that's being generalized to about the population. And then the population would be most professors everywhere. Sample, my professors, attribute, wearing glasses, population, most professors everywhere. Right? Very straightforward in that case. So. Um, those are sample arguments, and the questions you'll face on the assessments will often relate to that, to distinguishing between a syllogism and the sample and to identifying those features of a sample argument. Let's now turn to one of my favorites, the argument by analogy. Just like with the statistical syllogism, let me give you kind of the basic frame or structure of an argument by analogy which basically says these two things, X and Y, share some other properties, one or more. And that's why it says P, Q, R, and so forth. These two things share these two things, these other properties. But one of them also has this additional thing, this additional property, in this case, I. Therefore, the other one must also have that property. So the essence of these arguments by analogy is that, and write this down, I'll put it up on the screen. It's very important to remember this. If two things have something in common, they probably have something else in common too. That's the basis of an argument by analogy. If two things share some feature, they likely share other features as well. If two people like to read, they may have other hobbies in common as well. If two people like science fiction, and one of them likes the matrix, the other one may like the matrix too. Again, remember, it's not deductive. We could be wrong, but we're just saying it increases the probability that this other thing will have this thing in common with the first one. So if two things have something in common, they probably have other things in common too. Now, how do we determine the strength or weakness? And I'll come back to this in the next example. Uh, well, the first thing we can look at is can we even compare the things in the first place? Right? Are we comp comparing apples and pianos, two things that are completely different? Or are we comparing one school with another school? Well, it's fair to compare schools. It's probably not fair to compare apples and pianos. So the first thing we have to think about in an argument by analogy is, can we even compare these things? Is it fair to compare them? Are they alike enough? And then secondly, we have to think, how relevant are the, th are the attributes that are being associated with each thing? Right? So is the, is the attribute that they share relevant to the attribute of interest? Right? If they both like science fiction, is that relevant to them liking The Matrix? Well, yeah, because The Matrix is a famous science fiction movie. But if I said, these people both like science fiction movies, um, one likes 16 Candles, the other will, right? That's not a good argument because 16 Candles is a romantic 80s movie, high school movie. Um, it's not related to science fiction. So that would fail on that second condition there. Okay, let me give you this example. This example perhaps isn't aging so well. Paris Hilton is less lesser known these days. And I, frankly, I'm not trying to rip on Paris Hilton here, but... Um, uh, nevertheless, I think this argument uh, is, serves as a good example. And the argument would look like this. So, by the way, if you don't know who Dan Auerbach is, he's the guitarist of the Black Keys, the um, great blues rock band, great in my opinion. And uh, what if we were to make an argument by analogy with these two folks? It would probably look something like this. Paris Hilton and Dan Auerbach are both famous. Dan is a talented musician, so Paris is a talented musician too. So let's consider the argument and let's go back to the um, previous slide and think, is this a strong or weak argument? 
So first of all, can we compare two people who are famous? Sure. There's no wrong. They're both people. They're both famous. It's not. It's no problem with. There's no problem with the first condition. Can we compare those two things? Yeah, absolutely. They're comparable things. What about the relevant of after? What about the relevance of the attribute that they share together, versus connected to the attribute of interest that's presented? So let's go back to the argument. Um, the attribute they share is that they're both famous, and then the attribute of interest is that they're talented. Is that one is talented? Well, this would probably be considered a more weak argument because we know that people can become famous and not be talented, right? People can become famous for many, many reasons. They can become famous because they are talented, sure, but there's many a person who become famous because of, say, a sex tape or because of a, um, uh, their parents were famous or because they got lucky, right? Or because they were at the right place at the right time or because they made some stupid YouTube video that went viral. It doesn't necessarily mean they're talented. It could. The point is, though, that much many people seem to be famous not necessarily as a result of talent. Uh, it's obviously debatable to some degree, but they aren't associated strongly enough to make this a good argument. In my view, um, that would be a pretty weak argument. However, what if I said this? Paris Hilton and Dan Auerbach are both famous entertainers. So now the attribute they share is not just is, is, is being a famous entertainer. And then what if now the attribute of interest is Paris Hilton has a lot of money, so Dan Auerbach has a lot of money too. That's a little bit of a better argument because we know that if you're famous, you're more likely to have money. Right? You're more likely to be well off. Um, not always, but a lot of times famous entertainers in particular, comedians, musicians, um, whoever they are, uh, directors, actors, they tend to have money. So it's still not the greatest argument maybe, but it's better than the last one. It's, a, it's an improvement from the last argument, namely because that feature we identified, there is a relevance between the shared attribute and the attribute of interest. Now let me add, you, add one more example here, and then I'm going to make one additional point. So let's take another argument, and I'll throw it up on the screen like usual. Jane and Jill are sisters. That's what they share in common. Jane is a Buddhist. So Jill is a Buddhist. So think for a minute, is that a strong argument based on the conditions we looked at? Well, again, it's fair to compare sisters. They're both people, they're both from the same family. That's a fair comparison. But what about the relationship of being a sister of someone and having the same religion? Well, it's not terrible, right? I mean, we do know that people who grow up in the same household often do have the same religion. But we also know that there are many cases of people who go a different direction, right? And maybe she's a Buddhist and it was a response to her Christians who, or her parents who are Christian or Muslim or something, and she wanted to rebel and go in a different direction. We, we don't know. So I would argue that it's not a terrible argument. Um, it's not great. However, and, and here's the other thing. We don't even know if these sisters live together, right? What if they're sisters and their parents have divorced and they both live in completely different households? Right? That would change the argument too. So what I want to point out here is that if I start adding additional shared attributes to the first premise, it can strengthen the argument. So for instance, what if I added that Jane and Jill are sisters and they live in the same house together? Right? Now that strengthens the probability that if one is a Buddhist, the other would be a Buddhist too. What if I also said Jane and Jill are sisters, they both really love the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama is a famous Buddhist leader, and they live in the same house together. Now I've even more increased the probability that if one's a Buddhist, the other will be a Buddhist also. So again, we can never increase the probability to 100% because it's inductive reasoning, but we can increase the probability then uh, based on what it was before. We can make it better than it was before. And by adding new attributes that connect the sisters in this case, that strengthens the case that they'll have something else in common as well. I'm going to wrap this up soon, but I want to kind of end before we get there by uh, talking a little bit about the argument by design, which is a very famous argument for the existence of God. And um, it is an argument by analogy. It is an argument by analogy. So we're going to get a little deeper here, as we sometimes do in this class. And um, it's an argument that I like because I guarantee that some of you listening here have thought of it yourself.
And one of the things that's cool about philosophy that I noticed when I first started taking classes is it teaches you things you already know, but in a new way. Uh, so you may have already thought about, look at the beauty around us, look at a waterfall, look at the, you know, the beauty of human love, or look at the complexity of the human eye, right? How could this have all have arisen without some sort of a higher power, a higher being to create it? Um, it seems that the complexity we see suggests some sort of designer, right? That's the logic of the argument by design. And it's very clearly an analogy-based argument. So it's one that we can evaluate and consider. So for instance, the, let's look at how the argument plays out. Human designed objects in the universe both have complex working parts. What that means is that there's an order to, to the universe and there's an order to the things we create. So for instance, it's not like a computer is just some random, you know, thrown together technology that doesn't have any connection. Obviously, when you put a computer together, it has to go together in the right way to work correctly. And when we do put a computer together, it works in that way, right? It, it has this coherent, um, orderly design. However, what's interesting is that when we look at the universe, uh, it also has that, that seeming design. Um, because there are laws of nature, aren't there? There are things that are consistent everywhere. Uh, you know, from um, gravity to the laws of motion to um, the equations of quantum physics. There's some sort of regularity order to the universe. Is that not kind of like a computer, right? Is the universe in, not in some way like a machine the way that we build machines? So right there you can see the analogy. So that's what is meant by working parts, is that there's some order to um, what's going on, right? It makes sense. There's some sort of mechanical structure to it. Now, the argument then goes on to say, well, hey, human design stuff, like a computer, like I just described, they clearly have designers. So it stands to reason then, the conclusion, therefore, the universe must have a designer too, right? So think of it this way. We have a machine, a computer, that has working parts that go together that is orderly designed, and from that, there was some sort of creator or designer of that. Even if it was a series of people, they're still designer. And we're saying the universe has similar properties, also order and design. And therefore, there must be a, a creator to the universe too. If there's a creator to the mechanical things with order and purpose that we see, there must be a creator to the universe itself, which also has that order and purpose. So um, that's the argument. Now, the reason I have that picture on the right there is that one of the first people to come up with this argument, actually, I shouldn't say one of the first, the argument technically goes back to ancient Greece where some people made it in different ways. Uh, but one of the first in um, later times in the uh, 1800s to really popularize this argument was this guy, William Paley. And you can look up Paley's watchmaker analogy, which is another version of the argument by design. And Paley basically says that if you were walking through the forest and you know you tripped over something and you looked down and it was just a rock, you might curse and throw the rock out of the way. But if you looked down and it was a watch, even if it was one of those old school 1800s watches, one of the thing, the questions that might strike you is, hmm, I wonder who designed this thing. I wonder how this thing was designed. Right? Whereas a rock just seems like this sort of random thing that you step over that doesn't have any purpose, a watch does. A watch seems to have purpose. Why? Because just like a computer, it has order and structure. And so we would ask for a designer of that, and we wouldn't ask it for a designer of the rock. And Paley says, in a same way, in, the, in a similar way, we would ask for a designer of the universe because it's more like the watch than the rock. The universe as a whole, even though the universe contains rocks, the universe as a whole, Paley would argue, uh, actually does have this order and structure that make it likely that there is a designer to it. So this is the argument by design. Um, now, let's critique it based on uh, um, what we talked about before. And there's somebody actually already did the work for us. David Hume, philosopher David Hume, has a famous critique of this argument. Hume, though, didn't suggest that God didn't exist. He just said, this argument isn't good enough. Hume was an agnostic. He said, I don't think any arguments on either side of the debate are enough to show that there is or isn't a God. But nevertheless, he thought this argument was weak to show that there was a God. So anyways, this is what Hume says. The first thing Hume says is, let's go back to that first condition. Are the things we're comparing fair to compare? Comparing God to humans, 
You know, we're comparing to what the way God may have designed something to the way humans design something. So right away, Hume says, no way. This is extremely, not only is it presumptuous, but it just doesn't work. We can't compare gods to humans. And Hume points out also that we don't have any experience of the way a god may have created the universe. Um, so we've experienced the way humans create all the time. But who's to say that's anything like the way God created the universe? Even when we think of how nature creates, it's very different from the way we create. So for instance, when you create, when we create a child, obviously you have sex and then it comes out, right? I mean, there's no, it's not like you, you don't build your child like a Lego city or something. But the argument from design suggests that the way we create, it's all building and structuring. So the whole idea of what it means to create is actually not clarified in the argument. And Hume says, we don't know if a God would create, if he existed, if a God would create the way we do, right? So he says it's a weak analogy to begin with. You can't compare humans and God. But Hume goes on to say that even if we do assume the analogy is good, the, the argument doesn't lead where most people want it to lead. And I bet you anything, if you're making this argument, you're going to argue for monotheism. Right? Monotheism meaning that there's a single God who um, watches over us and created the universe. However, as Hume points out, this argument could equally point to different understandings of God from other cultures. So, for instance, Hume in particular targets polytheism. Polytheism is the view that there are many gods that exist and created us, usually with one higher God. Uh, the famous example of this would be the ancient Greek and Zeus and Athena and the rest of them, Zeus being the top god and then the others on the pantheon being below him. Um, but if we say that if we're going to compare the way humans create to the way God may have created, how do humans create, right? If we're going to follow the logic of the argument, let's ask ourselves, how do humans create? Well, when humans create, do they not make mistakes? Do humans not... Um, sometimes create things together with multiple people. Think about, and especially the more complex things we create actually involve a whole crap load of people. Think of an airplane. Is there just one person who builds an airplane? Not anymore, maybe in the time of the Wright brothers. I mean, you know, there was a few people, but now an airplane is a sophisticated engineering project and there's a number of people who are on that project. So if there's that many people that create human stuff like an airplane, especially complex stuff, wouldn't that suggest, if we're going to follow the analogy out, that it's actually many gods that created us? It's a complex universe, right? Wouldn't it follow, if, if, a lot of, if it takes a lot of humans to create one human thing, wouldn't it also take a lot of gods to create the universe? If we care about the analogy, right? That's the point, is the argument makes the link between, because you might be thinking, well, no, God's not like that, but we're only focusing on the argument. The argument specifically says God is like humans, right? God creates like humans. So... What Hume is doing is being a good philosopher and saying, let's take that seriously. If God creates like humans, then it might as well be many gods. Unfortunately, most people who present this argument, like I said, refer to one god and they use it to support their own view and their own religion, which of course brings us back to the confirmation bias. But Hume would say, you're not justified in that. It could point to so many different types of gods. And then the second point that I mentioned is that um, humans mess up when they create stuff. Right, there's the proverbial image of the writer just writing something down and messing up and crumpling up the paper and throwing it in the trash and starting again and crumpling it up until he gets it right. What if God did that with us? What if we're living in a crappy universe that God discarded? What if that's why there's so much suffering, that he just turned the dial a little too much on the suffering and he created a better universe somewhere, a parallel dimension that's way better? So Hume says, again, if we're going to compare God to humans, which the argument does, Hume isn't going out of his way to make the comparison. He's saying, but people presenting this argument are making the comparison. Then we have to acknowledge that God could mess up like humans too. Right? So the essence of Hume's objection is that God does not create like humans. We have, it, maybe, but we have no idea. Nobody's ever seen God create. Right? And all we have is our own creation to compare to him. So for Hume, again, he didn't say God doesn't exist. He just said, the argument's not strong enough to show it. Right? It's not enough evidence. So that was Hume's um, critique. Now, I do want to add one other thing, because I think once we start getting to the, um, thinking about the nature of God, what sort of God does this prove, 
there have been some people recently who revived the argument by design suggesting that maybe the god our god actually isn't the traditional polytheistic or monotheistic or pantheistic thing but it's actually more of a highly evolved intelligent alien who built our universe from within his own now this of course wouldn't answer the question of what started his universe right it would still it would be what we call an infinite regress but it would help explain our universe uh, so, in other words, what if our universe is actually a very sophisticated simulation, like The Sims or something, or, uh, you know, like The Matrix, and our God is actually more like our Creator is just a very sophisticated being who evolved himself or herself or itself in another context. That's a way to revive the argument from, by design, is to not talk about a specific God of a specific religion, because it gets too sticky and the confirmation bias enters in. But the argument from design, in my opinion, this is my opinion, this last part, um, the argument by design, in my opinion, can still have validity and strength. Um, I should say it should still have strength that's inductive uh, if we move it in a different direction and we think about the creator in a different way than we're used to thinking about him, her, or it. So anyways, that's the argument by design. I want to do just a couple of examples, and then I want to mention one more point. One of the things you'll be asked to do on the assessment is to distinguish, and the homework and classwork, is to distinguish between an analogy and an argument by analogy. Now, I, I, did, I mentioned this at the beginning of the PowerPoint, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, an analogy just states a comparison, and an argument by analogy draws a conclusion from it. So let's consider a couple examples based on that. And remember, you're going to see answers on the assessment that say, here's a passage argument or argument by analogy and you're going to have to know which one it is to get the right answer obviously so what if i just said working in this office is like driving around florida without ac working in this office is like driving around florida without ac not an argument it's just one claim and it's making a comparison it's just saying working in this office is like this X is like Y. It's just the first premise of an argument. It's not a full argument because it doesn't draw a conclusion. But what if I said this? She's no good at tennis. There's no way she's good at racquetball. She's no good at tennis. There's no way she's good at racquetball. That is an argument because they draw the experience of one person and they connect it to the experience in another domain, right? So they draw a conclusion. Given that she's no good at tennis, we could modify. Given that she's no good at tennis, it follows that there's no way she's good at racquetball. Premise, conclusion, argument by analogy. However, there is another unstated premise here, which again, you guys should know how to recognize at this point, or you should at least be aware that that's a possibility sometimes. And that is that tennis and racquetball are both sports that uh, use a racket you know, of some kind. And that's basically the idea. They're similar sports. Tennis and racquetball are both sports that involve hitting a, some sort of a thing with a racket. It's not like we're comparing tennis to bowling, right? So the unstated premise would just be the connection between tennis and racquetball, and then to logically lay it out, we'd say, well, she's no good at tennis, so she's probably not good at racquetball either. Analogy is implied but unstated, um, but, the, but it is an argument because it does have a premise and a conclusion, and it draws a conclusion from a comparison. So argument by analogy. How about this one? This is a famous um, one from Karl Marx. The great communist thinker said, religion is the opium of the people. Religion is the opening opium of the people. Not an argument, just a claim. It do, it, all it does is say, religion is like a drug, basically. It doesn't draw a conclusion from it. It's just a statement. However, we could, just to show you, we could turn an analogy into an argument by adding something, couldn't we? If I added a premise and conclusion, I could say, so religion is the opium of the people, drugs make people unaware of reality, thus religion also makes people unaware of reality. Not saying it's a good argument or true, but that's how we could make it an argument, right? We'd add an additional premise that ties it together logically. But just to be clear, just stating religion is the opium of the people and that's it, that's just an analogy. There's no argument. Okay, something else that you might be asked to, not you might, you will be asked to do on the assessments is to look at two different arguments by analogy and determine which one is the stronger one. 
So it's hard to evaluate the overall strength of an argument by analogy because there's some subjectivity in what we determine to be strong or weak. But in comparison to other arguments, we can clearly evaluate which is stronger. And there's a very objective answers here. So for instance, consider these two arguments and tell me which one is a better, stronger argument by analogy. Which one, in which one, is the conclusion more likely to be true based on the premises presented? So let's say I have Doug Gray is a successful businessman. He therefore would make a fine mayor. Doug Gray is a successful businessman. He would make a fine mayor. Now compare that to Doug Gray is a successful academic researcher. He would make a fine mayor. Doug Gray is a successful academic researcher. He would make a fine mayor. So I hope you can see that the first one is much stronger. And this is because the duties that one has as a politician, like a mayor, are much more closely related to a businessman's duties than an academic researcher's duties. An academic researcher is somebody who spends a lot of time in a lab, in front of a computer. Sometimes they have a reputation for being antisocial. Um, they don't, they, they, especially when they're researching, they don't talk to many people. They're just running experiments and r drawing up the results. Those aren't behaviors that are going to help you as a mayor. You're a mayor, you need to speak well, you need to be eloquent, you need to understand business dealings and numbers and things like that. Um, I mean, there's some relationship between a researcher and being a mayor, but being a businessman would clearly have qualify you more for doing that. Right? For, so for, just for take one example, if you're a businessman, you got to know how to talk to people and work with them, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be successful. Uh, and it says successful. Right? So if Doug Gray is a successful businessman, it means he's had success working with people and building relationships. That's much more likely going to help him in the job as mayor than an academic researcher. Right? So that's a case where um, the first one would be stronger. Now I want to give you one word of caution because sometimes students, instead of answering the question as it's asked, which is, which is stronger given these two arguments, they answer the question, which is the best argument overall? That's not what's being asked. Right? Where you're not, sometimes students say, well, they're both really weak arguments. Does not matter. I'm not asking you about the overall strength and weakness. I'm asking you about the strength and weakness in relation to the other one. And so. Remember that on the assessment. That will very much help. So the last thing I want to mention here is going to briefly take us back to a sample argument. And you'll notice that we covered a few deductive fallacies in uh, chapter 3. And a fallacy, as many of you probably know, is a mistake in reasoning. It's a failed argument. It's an argument in which the premises and conclusion do not connect or not relevantly related or there isn't enough to support the conclusion. Um, and you'll notice that the last two chapters in the reader are gonna be all fallacies. However, I'm gonna I introduce you to some along the way before we focus on them fully. And one of them we're gonna look at now is a fallacy of induction. It comes up in, anecdotal, it comes up in uh, inductive reasoning called anecdotal evidence. So as you'll see in the reader, this is a variation on a type of fallacy called hasty generalization. And a hasty generalization is basically a terrible sample argument. It's when you take a sample that isn't representative. As we talked about before, it's a, basically a biased sample. Uh, so for instance, I could say, I met one person last night at a party who was Scottish, so all Scottish people suck, or whatever. Uh, hasty generalization, right? So prejudice is often based on hasty generalization. Now, however, the, the fallacy of anecdotal evidence is a little more tricky because it says, and it's correct, correctly says that our own stories and experiences do not generalize to everyone else. And unfortunately, many people try to do this a lot. They say, well, I experienced this, so that must be the way it is, right? I went to, I went to school and this was my experience in that class and that's how this teacher is. Right? When other people may have not had that same experience or um, you know, I went to Japan and I lived there and it was amazing and all this great stuff happened. You know, Japan is great. Uh, so we often use our experience as the only evidence to support our case. And I would ask you, and that's what this free ride asks you to do, and I believe there's a discussion board that asks you to reflect on this too. Uh, how often do you do that? Do you feel like you use your own experiences a lot to appeal to other people, to make a point, to make an argument? 
And if so, are you fully aware and honest about the idea and the, or about the fact that your experiences do not generalize to others or may not? Um, now, I know many people use anecdotal evidence, but they're very honest, right? They'll say, look, this was my experience. I'm not saying everybody has it. Here it is. But other times people are very cavalier about it and they say, hell yeah, this is my experience and this is the way it is, right? So it's a question of humility, taking us back to Socrates and the, you know, he knew that he didn't know point. Um, but the reason I had that second question as part of this free write is that Sometimes anecdotal evidence can be the beginning of an amazing argument. Sometimes anecdotal evidence can be the beginning of finding a truth. Because you may have experienced something that you strongly suspect is shared by others, but you don't know yet. But you strongly suspect it. So a lot of research in the academic world begins this way. And I'll give you an example of my friends who, um, in my graduate and my doctoral program, uh, she was a fellow professor of math and um, she teaches around the area in math. And uh, she basically had the hunch, based on her classes, anecdotal evidence, just her experience. She had the hunch that a lot of her students who were struggling in math, who were struggling to do well in her class, it had more to do with a lack of economic resources and um, academic resources then it had to do with them being dumb or not ready or you know not at something like that. She had a hunch. She knew it was just her opinion and just her experience, but she had a hunch. And so I watched through the course of our program as she made that argument. And then when she did her dissertation, she actually did a research project investigating it. And she interviewed people. She did case studies. Uh, and she drew a representative sample of people in Southern California. Now her conclusion wasn't, that, and, and she let me back up and say that her anecdotal experience was verified. She found that a number of students, once they got the resources, they started to do much better. And there were there were students who literally couldn't afford the book, and um, as the point I've made in my intro video, right, there's a lot of people who struggle uh, in our school as well to have the right resources. And she found evidence of that. Now, being a good researcher that she was, though. She didn't over-conclude, she didn't overdraw her conclusion. She said, based on my research, there are a number of people in Southern California. She, she restricted her conclusion to schools in Southern California. She said, there are a number of students in Southern California, many who do not have the proper resources, and this is causing them to succeed, to, this is causing them less success, to be less successful in college than other students. And so she went from that anecdotal evidence, and she backed it up with deeper, um, statistical evidence based on a sample argument. So anecdotal evidence is sort of a double-edged sword because while well, it's true that sometimes people jump into a conversation and that's all they've got and it's a bit unfair because they assume that their experience generalizes to all and which would be anecdotal evidence. Their anecdotal evidence can also be a good starting point um, to a discussion or a debate. And my recommendation is that when you do draw from your experience you say you be, you're honest and you say hey look does anyone else have this experience like me, right? Rather than, hey, I went here and this is what happened, this is the way it is, right? That's, that's just not good reasoning. So anyways, I think I'm gonna end the um, lecture at this point.